Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It is the 22nd of November and getting ready to eat a lot of turkey. New videos this week. Uh, really just actually finished off the Azure Masterclass in its current iteration. So created the infrastructure as code and DevOps module, which includes actually how to use Git. And then a little kind of final thoughts, how to use the Git repo, just kind of bringing everything together. So let's get to the new features. And there are a lot of actually new capabilities this week. And if this is useful, uh, please go ahead and give this kind of a, a like, comment, subscribe, and share. So on the compute side, um, Node.js 14 is now available for Azure Functions. So when we create an Azure Function and we select the runtime of Node.js, we'll now see a version 14 available to us. For the Azure Kubernetes service, there's actually a number of different announcements. So the first was now Kubernetes 1.19 support. So we can actually go to our clusters and upgrade to 119 and then upgrade the node pools to take advantage of kind of that latest sets of functionality. The images actually used for the worker nodes are actually now aligning to the Microsoft security baseline. So if we think about these are the CIS hardened images that contain recommendations and best practices to really just improve the overall security posture. So now the AKS images used align to that Microsoft security baseline. And there's now a max surge configuration. So really this is all based around the idea that if we think about our, our cluster, our cluster is essentially made up of worker nodes. So let's say for example, we have three worker nodes. So when we perform an upgrade, what happens is it, it drains one of the nodes. But while it's doing that, that would mean a drop in capacity. So what it will actually do is during the upgrade, it adds an additional node. So as this one is kind of drained down, workloads can be added to this. There's no net difference in the scale. We imagine I had 100 nodes. By default, it will only do one at a time. So what max surge does is I could actually set max surge to let's say four. So now it will actually let me create four of these kind of additional nodes and bring down four drain four at a time. So it will let me accelerate that whole process. Now you have to be careful with that. If you set max surge to be too big, like the entire size of the cluster, well, it will drain them all at once and kind of bad things will happen. Obviously it is creating these additional nodes. So from a subscription perspective, I have certain quotas. So again, you have to make sure you consider, well, if it's adding an extra four nodes or eight nodes, depending on how big my cluster is and how much max surge is set to, do I have enough quota limit in my subscription? And obviously they're gonna use IP addresses from the subnet as well. So just make sure we consider, well, do I have sufficient spare IPs in the subnet that my worker nodes actually get created in? But essentially Max Surge is gonna let me do more than one at a time um, during my node upgrades. And then Container D Runtime, this is now the, the default runtime um, for AKS, it's kind of the standard. It's really just gonna give you better pod creation speeds, it's better stability. It's kind of the new standard. An ephemeral disk. So when we just kind of talked about those nodes, what typically happens is, I mean, obviously these are virtual machines. So ordinarily the OS is kind of a, a disk. It's on kind of Azure storage, and it creates that kind of VHD file, and that's what it uses for its OS. But obviously they're actually running on nodes. And that node has a certain amount of local storage. So ephemeral lets me say, well, the node has local storage. I'll just create the OS disk on there as well. Now, obviously, it's local to the node. If it failed, I would lose the state. But generally, we don't care about the state, really, of the work nodes anyway. So this would let me create them much, much faster. I'll get a lower latency. So now that option to use ephemeral OS disks is available for my AKS worker nodes. On the networking side, um, Azure Firewall Premium is now in preview. They've added a number of features to this. So TLS inspection. So what this will actually do is when I'm sending out my kind of encrypted packet, 
it will actually get opened up on the outbound journey, inspected, performing various security functions against it, then re-encrypted and sent to the destination. So I can now do packet inspection of encrypted packets. Um, it's got the intrusion detection prevention system capabilities, looking for um, byte sequences, looking for malicious instruction sequences. So it's now doing those types of inspections at the firewall. Now it has web categories. So instead of having to just do fully qualified domain names for every single possible type of service, now there are just categories that I can use, like gambling, um, social. So now I can actually use those to control the access. And likely to be used in conjunction with the categories is URL filtering. Allows the specific URLs in both plain and encrypted traffic um, to actually be checked against and allowed or blocked. So those features are all being added to the new firewall premium which will use firewall policy exclusively. For the new features, I will only use firewall policy, either applied directly or through firewall manager, but I'm not gonna use the classic firewall rules um, with these new capabilities in firewall premium. And then VPN over express route has GA'd. So this really answers the question people sometimes have, that well, I've got kind of my on-prem location, and then we think about, well, there's Azure. And remember, we have that great big Microsoft Backbone network. And I've extended my network to a Meet Me location. And obviously, Microsoft's connected to that. And it's connected to the region. And then I have my virtual network. I have my VNet. And in there, I kind of think about, I have my express route gateways. And I have gateways here as well at my edge, my, my kind of WAN edge. And what I establish is essentially private peering. But ExpressRoute does not encrypt. So if I actually wanted an encryption, I need an IPsec tunnel. So what I can now do is actually within my network, I could have kind of a, a VPN gateway. And in that same area, I could now have kind of the Azure VPN gateway, and over the private peering, I could then establish it actually to the VPN gateway to now that network space, and I'd have the encrypted tunnel. So now I can actually do a site to site VPN over Express Route. The reason we would do that is because, hey, I want an encrypted end to end connection between this IP space and that IP space. You do have to be careful. If you just advertise the exact same IP space over the express route and the VPN, um, Azure's just gonna take express route. So this needs to be a more specific IP range. So the traffic will actually flow via the VPN down through the express route. But that is now uh, generally available. On the storage side, so Azure Files Premium now has SMB multi-channel. It's been around in SMB for a really long time. The basic idea behind this is if you think about, well, I, I have a file share, forget about Azure for a second. As the client over here, it's gonna look like the same thing. If you think about how connections work, if it was just a one gigabit per second connection, it's generally fine because each session is really limited to one CPU core. That's really kind of the way it works. But if I start getting into 10 gigabits per second, a single CPU core would not handle that amount of traffic. So what multi-session lets me do is from the single machine, I can essentially establish multiple sessions. Uh, on my side, it would be something called receive side scaling. What that lets me do is each of these sessions can actually go to different CPU cores on my machine. So now I can get up to things like 10 gigabits per second and more. Well, this could actually now be Azure Files, the SMB 3.0. So now I can do multi-session from Azure VMs, for example. It's gonna use that receive side scaling to get me higher throughput than if I wasn't using multi-channel. So it's gonna let me use all of the cores of my machine to do that communication. 
and premium SSD performance tiers has gone GA. So this is the ability, if we actually jump over and look here, so this is that lets us actually have a performance higher than the actual disk. So if I just go and look at disks, for etc., and I'll just create a new one, what we're now going to see is under the size, yes, we have the regular size we pick, let's say 8 gigabytes, as I'm kind of doing here, but you'll notice I can also pick a performance tier. So I could use the size of eight gigabytes, but hey, I want the performance of something much bigger. And the whole point of this is, now I'm gonna pay for what the performance is, but it won't resize the disk. And what I can actually do is while, I've already, uh, post creation, maybe there's times I actually need to up my performance. Well, I can deallocate the machine or disconnect the disk, change the performance tier, it won't resize the disk, run it for that higher performance, and then drop it back down again. So it lets me change the performance without constantly resizing, making it this bigger, then trying to work out how to shrink it again. But I'll pay for that higher performance tier um, when I actually do that, but that's now GA. So, hey, don't check resize the disk, but give me the performance of what the bigger disk would be, and I'll pay for that bigger disk performance while I'm using it. Then miscellaneous. And um, Windows Virtual Desktop Short Path is in preview. So obviously Windows Virtual Desktop is the, the Azure VDI app publishing solution. And the way it typically works is if you think about Azure, then the Windows Virtual Desktop is kind of completely managed from that kind of management plane. I can think about, well, there's the remote desktop gateway, there's remote desktop web, there's broker components, and then what I have is a virtual network. In that virtual network, I have the various VMs that make up the solution. And what they do is they actually establish an outbound connection. So they do like a reverse connection to the gateway over 443 to then enable things to talk to it. So what Short Path does is imagine I'm kind of back on my network and I, I've got my machine. But I happen to also have, once again, maybe I've got that site-to-site -site VPN or express route. So I've essentially got kind of a connection to that virtual network directly. So what Short Path is gonna let me do is, yes, the initial connection still goes out to the internet this way. Hey, I'm authenticating, I wanna go and connect. But once I've done that, the Short Path will then say, well, to actually get to that VM, I'm gonna now go over my express route or site to site and go straight to the VM. So it's gonna not go via those gateway components every single time. Yes, it's initially gonna to talk to, via the internet, the, the RD web and the RD gateway, and obviously the gateway is talking to the broker, etc. But once you've established that connection, the actual ongoing communications will actually use this new um, short path capability, which is all UDP. I think it's, I've got it written down somewhere. I'm trying to find my notes, 3390. And it's actually using a new protocol. It's this universal rate control po protocol, which kind of learns and understands the network. So it's gonna really improve the overall performance of this. So short path, hey, yes, initial connection. This is not private link. Initial connection is still going out via the internet to that gateway and the RD web. Once I've done that though, if I have a direct path through Express Route or Site to Site VPN and I've enabled Short Path, then the actual from my web, from my RDB client to the actual VM, that will now go over whatever Site to Site VPN or Express Route I have. So going to give me a better overall experience. Um, Azure Policy now has GitHub integration. So this is all about the idea of thinking about policy as code. So what this is gonna let me do, and I'll show this super quick. So if we go and look here, if I go and quickly search for policy, what I can now do is link it to my GitHub repo. 
So I can go to my various definitions and I can do export. And I can do a sign in with GitHub. I've kind of done this already. And now you can see, you can see all the repositories I have in GitHub. I can set what branch, and then I can kind of say, well, what policies? This is gonna export the policies out to GitHub. And what you'll end up with, I did this already, is you'll end up with a policies folder. So this is the policy as code. So like my allowed locations, I can actually see the policy file that makes up that policy. I can also export out things like initiatives as well. Additionally, it creates a sample workflow for me. And what this workflow does is pushes it back to Azure. Now by default, I have to trigger it manually, but it even has the code here that I could comment out that would then on a push, i.e. I make a change, I commit it to the repo, it would actually push it back to Azure. And I think what it actually did as well behind the scenes when I set this up is it creates a secret, yeah. So it creates a secret and that's how it actually will go and authenticate to Azure to push those changes back. So the whole point of policy as code is you can kind of think about the workflow would be, well, hey, look, here's Azure. Remember, the whole point of policy is it applies at the Azure Resource Manager level. So if I'm using the portal, a template, a PowerShell CI, it doesn't matter, this will apply. Think of it as the core guardrails for my environment. So ordinarily we have kind of the Azure Resource Manager and then the policy kind of sits as the entry point ahead of the Azure Resource Manager. Everything has to go through that. So now what we're saying is, well, hey, I have a repo over here with actually my policy in. So now me as kind of the administrator, what I'll actually do is now, I'll manage my policies as code. So I kind of have my policy as code. I can modify them in whatever tool like VS Code. I could create them directly in VS Code, etc. So I'm modifying them. I'll then do a push up into that repo. So I've committed it, I'm pushing it here. And then if I enable that automatic workflow on that commit, it will then apply the updated policies to whatever scopes I say, i.e. various subscriptions or management groups. So now I'm actually doing this all through kind of this DevOps type mentality. I'm not going in the portal and modifying them here and there. I can actually manage them as code. Yes, I can export them to give me maybe that initial version into my repo, but from then on, obviously with get, I have that local copy, I'm modifying my policies, I'm saying, yes, this is good to go. I'll push it. If I enable the automatic or I manually will then actually apply them through GitHub Actions. Now you wanna be careful with this. And when I'm first using these things, uh, I would probably have kind of the, I don't wanna enforce these things. I wouldn't block people. I wanna see the audit, make sure things are working okay. And in addition to the GitHub Action to actually push them to Azure, there's actually a GitHub Actions to check compliance. So as part of other kind of pipelines that maybe deploy an updated set of resources, I can run a compliance check to say, hey, um, this thing I've just deployed, is it compliant? So there's another kind of integration with the whole GitHub Actions. But now there's this nice kind of uh, capability to start doing policy as code. Uh, Azure Monitor for VM Guest Health. This is in preview. This is all about just giving me a simplified view of some of the key metrics I likely care about and then alert me to. So if I jump over, if we go and look, I'll go back over to here and let's look at, uh, we'll pick this VM. So this is kind of an updated agent. If I go to Insights, and I could have gone to Azure Monitor Insights Virtual Machines, we see this Health Preview. So this is using those new metrics to get a basic understanding of kind of my free disk space, and the overall health of things, my available memory, my CPU utilization. It's just giving me, hey, yes, you seem healthy. So it's a quick, 
easy way to quickly go and see hey, the overall health and then actually react to it if I'm not healthy. Um, Azure Site Recovery now has support for 32 terabyte disks that I'm replicating from Azure. And then the Shared Image Gallery has a bunch of different updates. Let me see if I can get this to open. Always good fun. There we go. So here, if we just jump over to this quickly, we basically, all these are around now more direct integration with the gallery. So now I can capture to the shared image gallery directly from a virtual machine. I don't have to create a, a managed image or snapshot first. I can create an image directly from a disk. Again, I don't have to create a managed image or snapshot first. I can copy now images between shared image galleries and I can actually export out directly from an image to a managed disk. So it's kind of more flexibility in both of those directions. And that was it. So actually quite a lot of updates this week. Uh, I do hope it was useful. I hope everyone is, is staying safe and doing okay. Um, if you do celebrate it, have a great uh, Thanksgiving next week and uh, enjoy the turkey. Till next week, take care.